Hello? It is Chris from Air Windows going live for another Q&A session where I can answer questions, but we're also going to be coding something. So as people show up, uh, we can start talking about that. Right now we don't have anybody, but it's Monday, so I dare say somebody will show. And uh, I've got a certain amount of show and tell as well, but I was more or less focusing on uh, doing the coding part. It'll be a little bit like coding it from scratch, but not really because some of the things I'm going to be taking from uh, existing working stuff. But yeah, we'll see how that works out. I've got my list of things, and this is the concept I'm going to be working on today. And uh, now YouTube is showing me random pop-ups, eh, whatever. I do have a list of things to do that uh, that'd be interesting to pursue. There's the resample thing. Some of the dither stuff becomes quite interesting if you consider it along the lines of reconstructing the final output and seeing what that gives you rather than just calculating from the data coming in. But yeah, that's just maybe. So I'm, as you can see, I'm fooling with the microphone situation here because I need to be able to talk while also working on the laptop, which you will see more of momentarily. Uh, scooch it closer to me. The whole previous time, um, I was able to do my live coding, but um, if I turned to work on the laptop, I was turning away from the microphone so much that it wasn't uh, audible. This is probably not nearly as good of a microphone. In fact, I know for a fact this is not nearly as good of a microphone. This was going to be my reference microphone for um, doing a recording using that and the good one. And then this was going to be the unflattering realistic measurement style microphone, seeing as it's a lavalier, so it's hissier and noisier, but it also has um, considerably less distortion in a number of respects because it's a sort of a tiny electrode condenser mic, and those are typically used as measurement mics. Measurement mics are not flattering to the voice. I may as well leave this set up too because this is what I'm going to be using when um, doing a music jam, which is going to be sometime later today, so that I can sort of cup it in my hand and talk into it. Hey, David, we're coding today, David. We're going to make a, a reverb. And it, some point, probably not later than three, and not early, uh, not later than five, not earlier than three. I'm going to also jam for a couple of hours with some of the new uh, studio gear. But that says maybe that's for later. Right now, coding time. Boop. So here we are. Let's start from scratch. I need a, uh, a concept for a reverb, and I can do a dual mono, so it might be worth doing that with this template thing that I've got, which I've made available, but I can't necessarily help you um, install it in Xcode because these templates have tended to defeat me. That's why I do the VSTification of these things. Hang on a second. 
I'm sitting back here. So might be a thing to focus on that. Um, oh, the grant. Oh, I can focus on that also. I have some new uh, lens things going on, so if I figure out how to turn this properly. There you go. Got a zoom lens. Sort of progressively getting things in a more functioning fashion. So fool with my windows and screens, all of this gets very complicated at times. So yep, that's as good as it's going to get, I think. By the way, I can see chat, but if you find it too distracting, having it overlaid over the screen like that, I can change it. I've got it semi-transparent. In fact, I can fool with that too. Let's fool with it. Looking at the screen. Darkening it up a little bit. One of the things I keep doing is fooling with all these other details. And if that's boring, I apologize. Part of doing what I do is kind of having my hand in so many areas of production that it's kind of silly and a little crazy. And there's not a lot I can do about that because to produce the stuff that I do, I have to have some kind of handle on all these things. Also, I've got some stuff to show off that turned up in the uh, Biquad triple uh, video from yesterday. And again, this is a Q&A, so I mean, chat is open. So if you want to ask questions or talk or heckle or whatever it is you feel like doing, that is fine. What I'll be doing for the next uh, two hours or so is seeing if I can't do, let's make it a dual mono matrix reverb for now. Because the way I've got the template set up, if I turn on Coco View, that actually gives me, that actually gives me a stereo audio unit rather than a mono one. So we'll start with this and and I'm going to call that matrix verb because that is what I'm starting out to do. And I believe it's set up so that I can build it right away and something will happen. We'll open the screen up a little bit. Put it in here, and if I need to show it off, I can take this microphone off here. Did I check out SynthFest? No, man, I was busy doing a bunch of other things. I didn't realize that it happened. I remember getting a note from you about that. And I can open up. Uh, dear God, what did I have that was called Lazor? I don't know. We'll never know. I'm not looking at that right now. So what we've got as a matrix verb is default reverb template. It builds, it runs, and there's nothing there. So what are we going to do? We're going to open up this thing, which is a little clip that will make a interpolated delay buffer. That being one of the things that uh, I can assemble a reverb out of. And I'm probably going to dig into code for uh, MV. This is not code from MV. This is nothing more than a reverb. <coughs> Excuse me. Hopefully the, the compression caught that so it didn't smack you in the ear. So I'll copy that 
and then we'll start building it. As you can see, I've got uh, my text a little bit bigger so that it can be read. And we apparently weren't using that variable, so we know that one can get taken away. Now, if we were to paste this text right in here, we are using input sample, so it'll do something, but we haven't defined these other things yet. Also, that's an interpolated delay buffer, which is not necessarily what we're looking for. So, firstly, Rather than, and this is not the same interpolated delay buffer that I've often used, like on recent plugins. This is a simpler one. This one does just a linear interpolation between two samples, where some of the other stuff that I've done is a little more complicated. It does additional samples to kind of remove that tendency to soften things that you have if you just only interpolate. The thing about an interpolated delay buffer is this is what you would use if you were moving the sample like pitch bending it. So maybe we are going to hang on to this as part of the matrix verb. But firstly, let's start by defining some things. And honestly, it might be just as easy to dig up one of the other products. So let's do that. Plugins, AU. We'll dig up NV and see what we get. Here's our classic uh, MV. And this is made using a big pile of delays. So one thing we can do, and this is some form of darkening function. We're not going to worry about that so much, but we might need these. So let's start by just grabbing a pile of stuff. In fact, let's start by just grabbing literally everything out of here. Ideally, we remember to put it back once we're done. But uh, for the time being, this can get us off and running real quick. This is also known as um, like stack overflow mongering or copy paste programming. The criticism here is you're just copying stuff and making it do things without understanding what it does. In a sense, that's what I'm doing. And in a sense, it's not because this is also a head start on changing stuff. And I find it's easier to delete stuff that's functioning rather than sort of think it all out and code it all up from scratch. For instance, I need to make things like, as you can see, MV is made all out of all pass filters. But if I am defining delays and things, I can start from here, paste that in there. Somebody was also asking me about um, making the floating point dithering come out differently for every single uh, instance of a plugin. And I didn't agree to do that right away because it's very um, insignificant in effect. And I'm not getting into another update everything in my entire library. But if I did this is where that would be done. It is in the function reset. And that's where you start everything out and zero it out or blanket or do whatever it is you need to do. In this case, it's defining delays by um, uh, prime numbered uh, sample numbers. And this is where we start off our random number for the floating point dither. So if I was to take this and give it any other number, that would make all of the different um, dithers 
come out to different results. And there's value to that. I'm just not jumping on it right now. There's also some concern of like, I can do things like the function get sample rate, but I'm not sure where I can do that or whether I can invoke it somewhere like here or whether I can call another thing that'll give me a random number or because I only need to do this once so I can do any kind of random number. But um, so probably math would be fine. It's just when you're declaring stuff, especially in header files, sometimes you don't get to do any everything that you might want. And I've never been super duper clear on exactly the distinction between those things. But I'm like a musician, essentially, not so much a uh, programmer per se, in the sense of having total mastery of all these things. I find a lot of the programmers are maybe not so much musicians, and they don't have total mastery of the musical side of things. But let's see, first of all, I've got a bunch of delay buffers. So if I was to take this, this is now a delay buffer. I'm not actually functionally doing anything with it here, but if I ran this, it would uh, compile. And I bet that's true, so let's find out. Not so much, because we don't have count declared here. See what's going on? This is a function that is called void. I think, Kushal Jaju, I think you would have to host it in something like some kind of uh, blue cat patchwork or there's there's a variety of things where you can like wrap vst plugins and that's what you would use i'm not making like aax or whatever or rtas so you have to be able to wrap vst plugins and that would probably do it because there's not much to the air windows as far as being able to implement it so let's see and there's a, a question dusan spasic is there, no, there is no documented boilerplate on how to first time create one simple plugin. This is partly why I put those templates up, even though I'm not great at talking people through setting up a compiler, is because I generally found no help whatsoever. I blame capitalism. I think all the other plugin manufacturers and stuff tended not to be super excited about teaching other people to do what they do. Because what if somebody made a plugin that was better than theirs and took the sales and that would be terrible. So I don't have to care about that. So I will talk people through it as well as I can. But uh, I did not find any boilerplate, especially for VSTs. And that's kind of shocking, but it's still kind of true. Uh, if you are programming with juice, which is a what I found a very daunting and complicated framework for making GUI plugins, there's a lot of more people doing that. And that does seem to be a community. It's just that the GUI programming stuff gets into like a very much C++ language library that I never learned. And I, the fact that there were people being helpful in the juice community didn't help me because that wasn't what I was working with and I couldn't follow what they were talking about. As far as the language library I'm using, I'm using essentially C. It is technically C++ as you can tell by things like this says void matrix verb and the two colons is a kind of C++ thing involving having this be a sort of class that gets to run things like process and it's defining all of this stuff. I better put that back where it came from or it would not run. And this ends up being a chunk that I know can like run code. So I don't need to worry about that stuff. I mean, I'm having a glance at the, uh, the chat so it doesn't get past me too much. <laughs> Universal human rights version of a VST developer. Maybe kind of. You know, I've got uh, like 18 people or so here. So here, 
Let me show you some of the other stuff that I'm building, which is along the same lines. I showed this in the uh, Biquad Triple plugin. I've made some progress on building synthesizer parts for Dirt Cheap. Namely, this is more of that stretcher strip idea where you build basically picture frames out of frame parts as if you would be what you would use for making canvases. And you can buy these. The old versions, you can put your rack modules directly in at this size. This new version, which they stopped making standard stretcher strips to the same standard, this is now slightly smaller because it's cheaper to make. Therefore, your rack modules fall through this gap but, I was actually talking to my sponsor, I do a recovery program thing, and I told him my distress at finding out that uh, it no longer worked and I couldn't kludge it together in a way that would tighten this gap without making it look really horrible. And he reminded me, essentially, the perf board that I'm suggesting people use for this purpose comes at this size or technically, it comes at this size. You can buy packages of like 10 of these and it'll cost you like 80 bucks or so. It's relatively expensive to get large quantities of this stuff. But it comes like this and you can snap, I snapped them in half in order to fit them in a particular box that I'm not gonna be using because this is now the wrong size for that. But if you just use the size as you can directly buy it, let me not yank my microphone all over the place. You can now fit this onto that space or snap it into vertical slices and have a modular system that you can, like I was talking about before, assemble with thumbtacks. Thumbtacks are dirt cheap. This can all be done with hand tools I think I mentioned stuff that did not use hand tools on the plugin video, but actually that's the opposite. I'm coming up with a design where you could build functioning, working um, DIY synthesizers without needing power tools or drill presses or any of that stuff. All of this can be done with hand tools. And here's how you build this one is you make a set of these I think my uh, close-up screen is getting in the way there a little bit, but whatever. I've got it glued and also with a drywall screw holding it together so that I can stack it a little bit. And then these are relatively cheap hinges. And these are some hinges. Buy these things at like Home Despot or whatever and learn how to assemble them. Become a bit of a carpenter cabinet work and stuff. And you can build something like this. You'd be able to fold it up, carry it around, and it locks in place. And then you have a glorious big synthesizer test bed that you can thumbtack this perf board on in whatever pieces are relevant sizes. And build your circuitry on the perf board and be able to do all of that stuff without a machine shop or even a wood shop beyond, again, simple hand tools. You can break this stuff very neatly with an X-Acto blade and maybe a wrench or not even a wrench sometimes. Like going to the dollar store and getting tools at the dollar store is often enough to get rolling with this. So my concept here is to encourage stuff like that. Here's something else. This is, I am looking at getting a um, rolls of this wire. I can get it at a hundred foot from all electronics because they've contrived to get rolls of this stuff from Consolidated, which is where they get it. I am asking them for quotes on thousand foot rolls because I would like to be able to give people 
like ten dollars worth of ten colors of wire because this becomes your patch cables for building these things and even using only the like I've got ten little rolls of wire like this actually no I have seven because the the purpose is being able to give you the interconnects that you don't have to spend hundreds of dollars just on the freaking cables to put stuff together. And the way I made this was taking 10 rolls of the 100 foot length, sticking them on a mic stand and dragging them out, tying them off with some uh, a rubber band there, stretching them out to 14 feet, which turns out to be exactly $10 worth of wire at that price cutting them off and coiling them up. And I can send these to people for 10 bucks. If you were to buy the 100 foot rolls, then it would cost you uh, a little over 70 bucks to get into a set of wire of all the different useful colors so that you could set up a interesting, like the idea with the colors is, okay, we can use black for ground, we can use white for a voltage supply and that leaves brown, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and gray as channels. Because that's the way I've color coded my system is if I'm doing particular kinds of mixing or whatever, I'll often want to arrange it so that it's okay, my base is coming in on the blue channel. So the interconnects that I'm using for that would be blue cables. Unfortunately, buying blue cables from Hosa or whatever gets expensive. I've got a bunch of them over here. And if you design the system correctly with the right kinds of uh, IC sockets for connectors and things like that, it's slightly fiddly, but then you can use bare 22 gauge solid core for the interconnects, which means you can patch everything together and do enormously more and start off with your 10 bucks worth of solid core. Or again, if you were going to buy it uh, by the 100 foot length, you should go to all electronics for that. And that becomes uh, close to 80 bucks. Or you could buy 20 foot, 25 foot rolls, which they also offer at all electronics. And I believe that would cost you about 28 bucks for the entire set of colors. It's just that the cost of per foot goes up that way. And I'm working on being able to get people the tools that they need to do this kind of experimenting for a considerably less cost per foot, or less cost of all these different things so that you can do more from a really basic starting point and then jump in. And maybe if you start doing that and you know that you like it and you get excited then you're like, okay, I'm going to buy hundred foot rolls from all electronics. That's going to be 80 bucks, but I know I'm going to use it eventually. And you're off and running. Let's get back to the coding. I know people like that. So what we're doing is, and let me see. Glancing over at the chat to see if there's any other questions doesn't look like it right now other than stay hydrated. Well, coffee doesn't really count as hydration, but uh, coffee is a diuretic. It will make you less hydrated. This is what we're going to be trying to build. So I got to walk through some of the introductory stuff here, starting, I think, with some of the code from NV. Like here is code from MV. This is how that one was made. I copied this over now, so we've got that to start with. Uh, I tried to build it and it didn't actually build because I don't have count defined here, but we're not necessarily using that bit at the moment. And this is a, uh, MV distorts interestingly. This this is the rawest form. In fact, let's copy this over too because we're probably going to want to use that. I like running internal stages of uh, console 
And that's what this is. This is making the input be a sign, and then after everything, the output is arc sign, and that is the simplest console. That's, that's purest console. So we'll do that. And there is a gain in there. We can leave it in the same position, kind of similarly to how MV had it. Now we have a version of console running inside this already, and it will definitely work. But we haven't done any of these all passes because we're not necessarily going to be using specifically the all pass. And how this works is, and, and this is the, the functioning MV plugin. This is the one that I'm using in that uh, crazy rock metal song that I'm constantly doing. I really need to record new music at some point because it gets tiresome even for me, never mind everybody else, to constantly have the same uh, demo audio going. But this is what I'm using for the reverb of that. This is the sort of Bloom style uh, reverb thing I've got there. And it's made out of switch stage and all these all passes. I can also glance up here to see that uh, they're all associated with A through Z. I got 26 of them. That's basically just because I used to do that rather than make more complicated things, which I could actually get away with just fine. There's not a problem with making loops for some of this stuff. You can make more complicated code that doesn't take as much space as this. But this is still a fairly effective way of doing it. And you'll notice one thing about this is this just picks where you jump in to the code. Like if stage is a very high number, and stage being the first parameter, which in NV, let's see. Our first parameter, of course, was depth. So when you crank up the depth control, you get a larger number. It's 0 to 1. It's multiplied by 27 and it's an integer. So you're basically just picking this number and a larger depth means you're starting at A. If it's a smaller depth, it starts somewhere in the middle. If it's a tiny depth, like 0 or 1, you get only the these ones. You see that the numbers are sort of inverted, starting at a high number and counting down to a lower number. And there's also the lack of a particular thing in here. If you had that, then you'd pick one of the things, do it, and then only it, and then stop. But since I don't have that in here, when you pick one, it jumps to that point and then does everything after it. At no point does it break and jump out of the system. So that's, how I, that's the technique that I use to jump into something that's a pile of processing and be able to scale how much of it I'm doing. So let's start by grabbing a piece of this. We got that. You'll see it kind of blink in there. That'll show me that this is the bit of this that operates. This won't show me the same thing because this particular, it'll blink it, but it's off the screen to the top. And I have a little pile of code, which should include that if I'm going to take this piece. That's kind of like this area in here. It's doing something up, oh, except for I picked the wrong one. So just because this was uh, case one doesn't mean that it's all pass uh, A. In fact, that happens to be all pass Z. I was going to pick all pass A to do it with, so we'll grab this one. I'm just going to try to get something that makes a sound for starters. I'd like to get something that makes a sound like within, I don't know, another 10, 
15 minutes. And one of the things I need to do for that purpose is do the part that is counting our offset position, but that's probably already happening. That's going on in here. So these filters are all running their independent timings. So let's shut that off for the moment. I have all past temp defined somewhere else. So let's divvy this up into some separate areas. This part is the filtering part. And what you see that doing is I'm keeping a number called AVGA and AVGA is for averaging that particular one. If that's engaged, what happens is I take the uh, last sample that produced and I average it sort of on the output. That's how I kick in the darken factor for MV is each of the little delay buffers has this in it. And so if that engages, and that is uh, counting damp, and it will uh, scale up as you go. We don't need this for what we're doing right now. In fact, one thing, all we really need is the raw delay factor. So, and we don't need the all pass filter. If we need that, we can go and get it again. So, we're going to take some of these apart. Like this all pass stuff is how you make an all pass filter, but we're not concerned about that. We want to make the simplest possible delay and then we'll start doing stuff with it. Now, let me see. We could just find out what happens. This part isn't going to work because it has this count variable in here, but this probably might. We're going to find out whether it does or not. Um, and we don't necessarily need console in here either. So we're just going to comment out a whole bunch of stuff. We've still got the gain control in here, and we've still got a wet control in here. Now all that happens is we get our sample. We assign something in the delay buffer to this. It is set to have a variable. This is 7,573. Uh, count is actually twice as big as that. So we might be able to bring some of this in in a minute. Some of the stuff that I'm doing with this formulation up here is being able to use smaller delay buffers because we can do a calculation inside the delay buffer. However, this is just wrapping around and we're using this number. We're assigning this thing to input sample and then we're going minus minus meaning that we're going to look at the one before it. It could also be plus plus for the matter, for that matter. And if the number becomes less than zero or it happens to have started out as larger than delay A, then we set it to immediately delay A. This is a kind of delay buffer that is not going to interpolate. So this is not what you would want for like a flanger or a chorus or something where the pitch is shifting. Up here, 
is what you would want for that. Um, but let's start off by just running this. I got three warnings. All the warnings are is I have not set this. When it says trigraph question question ignored, what that means is matrix verb version eight is where you tell it what the identifying number of the plugin is. Oh, Hank has a quick question. Where do you put your dither plugins? At the end of your master chain. Always at the end of your master chain. That's where a dither plugin goes. That's where you place it. Uh, and dither plugins are for the purposes of going to a uh, fixed point, whether that be 16-bit CDs or 24-bit everything else. You don't actually place a dither plugin to go to other places in the mix because that's still happening in floating point. So that is strictly for the plugin developer if they wish to do. What's the good ID for a matrix verb? MTVB, perhaps. MXVB? MXVB. I'll save that, and now I won't get those warnings. Build. No warnings. It's fine. Now when we move this over to here. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll run the uh, a drum sample this time. Recent effects, matrix verb. There should be a single delay here. Gain is still just a gain control, but now dry wet is giving me the difference between the input signal and the one delay thing we've added. Hear that? It's a laptop. Everything I do involves so much background research and everything that uh, I don't have the live feed because I'd, I'd have to have a live feed into the system giving you a direct uh, signal input, but also be able to hear it. I don't have that going on at the moment. But I have just showed you that we do have a delay. So we have just coded that. Now we have a audible delay. So now let's see what happens if, uh, let's see, we're doing up as a scenario and alp is larger than delay A. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This is the same as this. So, See how these are kind of like the same thing? I'm assigning the input here. We're moving the delay tap. And this is either just taking the direct signal, and we'll use this again. And this is now a interpolated thing, meaning if ALP A is moving or it's uh, happening at a different rate. Let's see now, is that really? Some? Offset is what we're concerned about here. So let's fool with that a little bit. Um, do we have offset defined up here? No, we don't. So what we need to do, if we want to have something changing stuff, is define a thing. 
Actually, come to think of it, we're not using AVG for stuff, so we could use AVG, which is already present in our code. Now save that, that's not really a change. We've set it to be zero. Now we've got this space here, the gain control there. Now we're telling AVG to be larger. And for the time being, I think we can actually just do that. What I'm thinking about is how do I make AVG turn into a kind of varying thing that will make offset move and I was going to turn it into a sine wave and that is certainly something that I can do. So let's quickly code up something. We do have to define offset but technically we can define that right here. Offset equals and then once we've defined that we'll be able to use it and we're defining it right where we're using it because that makes sense. Absolute value of a sign-like number. So what that just did is we're defining this thing called offset and we're using AVGA to calculate it. AVGA is slowly increasing. I can make it increase at any desired speed. In fact, I can make it increase by this speed. We'll use slider two because it's there. This is why I've got the template set up this way. I often like to put parentheses in things when uh, the, I don't like to rely upon just the precedence of the math operators. It works, but I find it confusing. You can do stuff where it's this pile of like, this is a plus, this is a times, this is divide, and control how the number comes out by knowing the precedence of the operators and I often like to put parentheses around things just to make it really explicit, like we're doing this first. We're not doing, uh, and this plus equals thing means whatever we've got here, we're gonna add that to AVGA. Now you'll notice that there's something about AVGA that I'm not telling you, which is I'm not stopping it. Some of these things where you're making a, a number scale up or down or whatever, like this, if I'll pay, it's being mi minus minus, and then if it's less than zero or larger than delay A, it becomes reset. Or if it was I'll pay plus plus, then you'd go, if it's larger than delay A, it would be zero and it would start over. I'm not doing that with AVGA because if you take the sign of some really high number, the sign of a number wraps around. It just keeps on circulating so that will produce offset. And as any, anybody can guess what this is going to do, what it should do is pitch modulate input sample between just the nearest samples in the delay buffer. It should soften the sound a little bit. And it's not a big enough change it's not moving far enough in the delay buffer to really give you a sense of pitch modulation, but this is what it's doing. It's going back and forth between one sample and the next sample along. Although, 
I will point out that, uh, let's see, we're defining uh, this as input sample, then we're subtracting one, but to, to get the previous one in the whole entire loop. It's designed so that you just put a new one in, go one over, and that's the whole entire loop. But to make this interpolation thing work, I need to refer to the previous one and then the one beyond that, meaning this second bit here, that needs to be a minus, not a plus. And since we're doing minuses, that or we could go the opposite direction. Shall we just do it the way that it's configured? Let's do it the way that it's configured. Because there's two ways of solving this. This ought to work. Oh, act, that was wrong. That's where I want to do it. Now we're doing plus plus, meaning that we're establishing a sample and then going one step away from it, at which point we are, um, uh, David, I don't think that ULAW is included in Rack Windows, although you could lobby the guy to do it. That could be a thing. Now we're moving positively, meaning that if we're looking at uh, the one next along, the full delay buffer is there. And then if we step one farther, it's yet another step in the delay buffer. Another thing that's happening here is we can take the sample value from delay A and since we are at a full size thing, this is now the size of our delay buffer. Although I fear that this is uh, going to maybe leave it with, uh, generally when I'm defining these, I define them with this size and then instantiate them by counting up to this number and then use an even smaller number for the wraparound to make sure that I'm not getting garbage data in there somewhere. We'll leave that alone for now. And let's see, 990 to 991. So Now, in theory, this should work, but we'll see. And I do have the warbling effect here, so we're going to find out whether this is functioning or not. It does build, but that doesn't mean that it's right. And this time, we're going to pick a sine wave. I wonder what frequency that is, whether it's going to come across here. Nope, not on that laptop. Hi sign. There we go. You can hear that. So we're not going to tell whether the reverb is the delay part is working, but we can hear that the delay actually is happening. You can hear it kick in. The bidoo, that's it kicking in. And now if we do wet, that's not sufficiently audible. So instead, let us
Maybe we can make it go faster. AVGA is going to be a steadily increasing number. We are not offsetting it anywhere, so uh, that is a steadily increasing number. We are calculating the sign on it. We are doing the absolute value, making sure that offset is going to go from basically 0 to 1. It's not very smoothly arrived at, though. Let's do further calculations. Actually, that's not where I want that parenthesis. So now what we're going to do is take the, maybe this will help. We're taking the sign value, which will be going the, like the way that the uh, thing works is you start feeding. Hmm. See, I'm contemplating all of this very hard. I feel as if the way sines and cosines are calculated, the, I use them for distortions. So probably it is actually giving me a zero to one or a negative one to one. So here's the deal. Let's go on the basis if that's what's happening. Worst that'll happen is our input sample amplitude calculations will be screwed up. And that's pretty harmless. So we're going to say it's this plus one, meaning it'll hopefully be a zero to two swing. I think that's how the output of the sign works. I don't know why I was going for the input of the sign. Input of the sign, you give it 1.57 and you get out one. And we're dividing by two, which is, should be scaling it to the amount that we want. And we've also speeded up AVGA and we're not dialing it back nearly as much. So let's find out what we got. This is all kind of sketchy, but this is also how we discover things sometimes when stuff pops out and you didn't expect it. So let's see. Back to our high sign. We know that the delay is working, so there's that. And we're going to see whether we can get a audible effect out of this now. Not so much. Okay, so Let us, I want to show you that warble. I want to show you that this is how you do the thing. So I'm going to take out this um, interpolating thing for the moment. Int offset equals average a plus one, but so you see what we're doing? We still have average a increasing continuously. And my, my statement is that when we put this into the sign, that's going to continue giving me an oscillating thing until essentially it runs out of space and wraps around and that's still going to give me an oscillating thing. So I can include that and make it work. So I'm making offset be a much larger number. Hopefully it should be changing between about zero and 600. Actually, it's going to be about 1200. And it won't really matter because we're wrapping it around like this. This is the bit in the middle of this where we're looking up what the index is of our delay buffer and we're adding stuff to it and how much is added to it is how big in the delay buffer the delay is.
So if we add this number that should be fluctuating, and we're making it fluctuate by about 1,200 samples, uh, that gives us a bigger, a different position in the delay buffer, but we could run off the end of the delay buffer. So this part here, the uh, minus here, we're doing this in here, and it is a question. When we say alpha A plus offset is larger than 15149, there's no equals there. We're not assigning anything to anything. This is asking a question. This is a logic statement. The output of this in here is going to be true or false. Oh, you can't quite see it, can you? Uh, let me scroll it up. This is going to be a true or false question. Is this larger than 15149 or not? If it is, there is another operator here that is question mark, which tells you it's a logic question. And then we have two choices. If it is in fact larger, you get the first choice. And the output of this, which is minus something, if it's larger than that, then we subtract everything until we're wrapping around to the beginning of the loop again. If it's not larger than that, we subtract zero. And that's how we construct a delay buffer that should be able to handle what we're doing. And I can build this, and it should build without issue. There we go. Put in components. I should get a warble out of this. I'd be a little shocked if I don't. I've just hacked it very aggressively. Hey, Joko, I was just talking about... Joko was talking about the randomizing the random starting figure of, of things. And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And I'm not in a super big hurry to do it. So I'm doing this today. Matrix verb. And we have some kind of glitch in the buffer. And I gotta say, it still ain't warbling the way I expected. So, so what do we got going wrong here? We've deleted this or commented out this bit. And I know exactly why. See this? I forgot to do something about this part. So, you might be able to tell why something went wrong. Uh, I have to. So, I'll use a separate variable and Here's where I was having a problem. This offset thing might very well be working, but we also tried to multiply it by one minus possibly a very large number, minus four possibly a very large number. So we'd have to go back to offset for that to work. But let's close up some of these spaces a little bit. having talked about them. Let's see whether that helped. I'm going to try to get a warbling frequency out of this. You know, we haven't even gotten around to doing the matrix reverb, but sometimes that's what this is like. I can totally multiply the sign statement, but that wasn't the heart of the problem there. And no, that's it. Oh, wow. 
That was doing ninth, not second. Second wasn't doing anything. Interesting. Where's that in the code? Slider two. Oh, this is what caused that to happen. I was referring to slider two, but I've got this code in here, making all of this stuff connect to each other. So now I can demonstrate at least the warble. I don't even have to recode it at all. All I have to do is know that ninth was what was making it do something. There's our warble. This is just to make David happy. And we got fun. So now my question is, what's happening with that offset? That's not working. So I'd like to make it behave itself if I can. I don't like the, the clicking I'm getting. Uh, this is not a one. I can do stuff like this. No, 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 plugin is not done. We're doing many other things besides this. Now that I do have the warble though, because I was just touching the wrong control for that, let's undo some of this stuff and see if we can get it happening. with the original code that wasn't clicking. We're going to go back to this. Divided by two. Now we have the same warble at the same speeds, which are actually quite fast. So it turns out my initial idea was correct. I can slow it right down. But now we're warbling only between these two samples, which are hopefully not smashing the buffer up and causing problems. It's no, that's not greatest BST ever. Honestly, guys, it's seriously not. I can make you crazy stuff though. Unused variable, remove this. I don't care. Let's ignore that for the moment. Doop. And now that we know that it is the last slider to use for this, That's not a very obvious change, is it? So let's see. Sign average A bread. That part was working. I don't need the absolute value because we're making it be positive now. So we're going to simplify this a little bit. Sign average A should still be modulating. Let's make it go fast again in case we can hear it easier as that. Trying to make a sound here that causes something to audibly happen. And I believe that stuff between minus one and plus one, plus one gives us zero to two. We're looking for zero to one to do this particular, hang on. This interpolation thing is capable of scaling stuff itself. Well, let's see where let's see where we get with it for the starters. Um, but those both are the same. Put 
putting that aside and doing the same thing here. Now we have comparing minus, one minus offset or just offset. So now that should be just an interpolation. I had it set up in such a way that it was actually able to handle a larger offset, but the offset was giving me clicks and issues, so let's not deal with that. Build succeeded because we haven't done anything sufficiently bad to break it yet. Let's see whether we can make some kind of warble or noise happen out of this now. Signs point to not so much. Okay, this is getting boring. I want to do the matrix stuff that we we're talking about. Sometimes you wind up just grinding your face in the dirt over this kind of stuff endlessly. And uh, although let's go back to fooling with that stuff. Again. Hang on. We'll go back to that. It wasn't actually doing anything bad right then. The whole purpose of it is as your frequency gradually increases, as your position gradually increases, it'll start imp interpolating. <sighs> So that once you're at one extreme, it'll, it's a little complicated to explain. Uh, save. So let's see, we do have a warble effect that we can make happen. When we make this be a large offset, such as times, we'll call it times 10 for now. We're not going to use int. And we're going to build something like this because adding stuff is relevant to what we're doing here. And then we're replacing this with the one that's been incremented. This stuff should not count. So in theory, in theory, this will do our we're going to find out quickly what that did. This is one of the reasons I like a quick operating cycle for this stuff is because I can relatively easily hear what happened. Just try something and see what it did. Okay, that's fun. Notice, however, that we have a tick. And it is not connected to the speed of the vibrato. That suggests that it's that issue with our uh, delay buffer. This is not happening at the vibrato speed. This is happening at the speed of the overall delay buffer. So let's have a look at that.
we're calculating like this. Oh, I think I see what's going on. This may have fixed it. Let's find out. See how we're counting up to a buffer that size? If alp a is less than zero or alp a is larger than what actually was half the delay buffer, we were resetting it. I think that was confusing things. Let's find out if we made it better. Compiling, building, replacing, And now if we run it, I think it'll act differently. What is it gonna do? I lied, that's not actually what it is. So what do we got here? We got a weirdness that is now behaving as if it is acting strange around this uh, offset filtering thing. So what shall we do? We will get rid of this sign stuff and instead EVGA is being incremented so Now it's being incremented, and then if it goes too high, it stops. Or we could make it be a sawtooth. Shall we make it be a sawtooth? At any rate, um, we're also not concerned with the, uh, let's see what we have as a ramp. Or maybe not, maybe that's actually not a good idea. Um, we got ALPB, this is an integer. This is a little kludgy, but should work. So now we got a VGA going up and down. And if it goes beyond this amount, a VGB becomes always negative. And if it goes less than zero, because it's now becoming reduced by something, then it's always positive. And what did we start it out as? Uh, VGB was actually starting out as zero, so. We've got this kicking around and we know that it's a persistent variable, so we will just use it. And that should give us a ramp wave. Will, the delay portion will go up and down. And working variable is where we offset in our buffer. And working variable is going to be our counter, but going up and down. We can also uh, count ALPA differently, but ALPA is actually a integer, so there's only so much flexibility we have there. I do a matrix verb. I really need to build the matrix verb part of this soon. 
as we haven't gotten into doing it at all and it's 12.20 already. I keep trying to demonstrate little things. Now we have this slowly moving. That's interesting. Can you tell what might be happening here? we're kind of scaling from full volume to no volume. That's what's making this happen. When that, what that means is this bit is not doing what we thought. Offset minus floor offset is not doing what we thought. So Uh, possibly because, see, there, see our problem? AA or AB? AB is blank. There's nothing in there at all. We're not updating it at all. So we're using this, we're doing the interpolation, but then th this is where the problem really lies. We're doing the interpolation against an entirely separate delay buffer, which is nothing is happening to at all. Let's fix that. One character. I don't know why I missed that all this time, but sometimes that's how that goes. You look in a different place in the program and you go, oh, hey, that might have something to do with it. Now let's see what we got. Having done that, we could probably go back to the sine wave thing or the warbling thing and see what we can get out of there. Now... We still got our test tone and it's not working quite the way that I thought. So we do seem to have the oscillating thing operating properly. Well, it's meant to be acting like a pitch shifter, kind of. So working variable up a plus offset. Technically, that means I could be putting this in here, kind of like I had before, because that didn't turn out to be the problem. All I have to do is be able to calculate that part. Now, offset cannot be so big that it's beyond this number, but it can be bigger than what we've got. Let's make a VGB bigger, 10 times bigger. It's being defined here. We're not changing it anywhere in here except for that we are inverting the polarity of it. Joku? It's shaved. I don't know what makes you think that is going back to drugs. It's shaved. That's probably why I seem different. Honestly, I don't know whether it's hard to tell what that signifies to you. Like for most of my friends, suggesting that I was going back to drugs would seem like a bad thing. 
I'm not sure that that's true for you. Maybe for you that would be a good thing, and so that's not like a mean, nasty thing to say to me. The folks I hang out with would consider that to be a bad thing where I'd probably stop trying to help people or doing anything, and I'd just be stealing money to get more drugs and so on. And that's not happening, so... Let us see whether we can make the pitch range that this goes across a little greater. Offset equals uh, AGBA. Wait, do we? Let's double check. Yep, that is a floating point number. Hello, that's interesting. I've made some kind of mistake. And uh, I think I probably know what it is. Ah, yeah, because offset is a floating point number. What I'm going to want is uh, something that's not a floating point number. We can go back to working variable. There's no reason we can't. Honestly, if I went back to drugs, guys, I'd stop doing plugins and I'd just be sitting around doing drugs. That's what that's what it was like when I was doing them. So doesn't work in a particularly useful way for me. Particularly if I was frustrated, like with this stuff. Let's see where we stand with this. Again with the sine wave. Effects. Interestingly, they did a pitch shift, and then it just died. I'm not quite sure why that is. But we are getting a result, so there's that. Why don't we ramp this way up, then? I think we're moving too slowly. Average B can go between 10 and minus 10, and maybe that'll do something. And we're super not getting around to making the matrix reaver, but maybe we'll just have to come back to that. And do that next week or something. Yep, something gets full and then doesn't reset or go back. I believe I am going in the direction of working that one out. Let's see. There you go, another fun one. And I'll tell you why it's doing that. We are successfully going between plus and minus. It is successfully tracking back and forth, in fact, quite neatly. It's over a very large sample buffer. And since it's such a large sample buffer, it's able to resample this sine wave, this test tone. So we're getting an interpolated, neatly handled kind of, there is some aliasing in there, but we are getting a pitch change. But this is a ramp wave. It's only going up or going down. So the end result of the pitch for changing the buffer at continuous speeds is not a vibrato. It's a oscillation between two pitches. Therefore, see, here's where things get really interesting. 
I can use a smaller number for this. Actually, therefore, we can go back to a quite earlier thing. We no longer need to calculate that at all. We no longer need to use that number at all. In fact, we can put it back to zero just for good measure. And average A is now just increasing. So oh, that's not how to do that at all. Offset equals sine average A plus one. And then we're going to throw in some parentheses just so that we know what the scope of this is. And oh wait, not divide times. Now we should have a vibrato over quite a large range. It doesn't have to be though, because tell you what, let's get rid of this silliness. It's going to start complaining that some of these variables are not used. That's fine. We don't care about that. So instead of manipulating slider 9, we're going to manipulate slider 2, and we're going to scale it by slider 3. Want a X? There we go. Therefore, if slider 3 is at 0, there will be no effect. If slider 3 is at max, there will be a big effect. And this should give us our variables the way we need them. And again, 18 warnings, that's because we didn't use these. That's why I had that line in there that where they all referred to each other. Now, dum -dum -dum. I sign, and this is kind of giving us the vibrato plugin in a peculiar way. I've already got this plugin out there. There we go. Nice, clean vibrato. is aliasing. And what you're hearing there is simply, this is happening in two channels at once. They're not synchronized anymore. Sometimes they'll go out. So what we got here is two different sine waves, both pitch bending. Good fun. So this is what I was trying to demonstrate 45 minutes ago. And as you can see, the whole problem was this character here being a B. Go figure. Now that we've got this, however, we could maybe start looking into doing our matrix reverb. Because we were going to do a matrix reverb. El Tataka, my car! Oh, did I just break your car with my audio? Yikes. I'm also curious, however, I guess that's not so much of a, I don't think I ever had anything 
that was only going to modulate by one sample. You could, you could do that, but I don't think I chose to do that. So let's do something else. Let's do the uh, matrix reverb thing, and let's see how quickly we can do that, because it's 12.30, I was going to do about two hours of this. Mind you, you can go longer than that sometimes, but I'm not sure that I'm down with that. Delay A. Let's put all of these things with delay A. I can update that later if I want, but And having done this, I am going to quickly do another test just to see whether it's behaving itself properly. Oh, offset was not declared in the scope. Let's put some of this stuff back so that I can test it the way that I was hearing it before with the vibrato stuff. I think that will help me hear whether this latest change that I've done. It'll be over a smaller space, but I've just changed it in such a way that I can start making multiple units of this. And maybe that would be fun to make multiple units of this and have them all go at once. I'll show you what that sounds like too, but then I'll turn it into a matrix reverb. So. This should still be a vibrato. This should still sound clean. I call that reasonably clean. Some aliasing, but I'm listening for nasty clicks. Here's another example of how you do that. This is a sine wave that is much lower. You know, I don't even need to have headphones for this. It's making a sign. And that is purely like aliasing and ring modulation making that happen. But I'd be hearing high pitched clickings if something about the buffers was wrong. And like one of the samples was being repeated or different, there would be a sound. I mean, this is a sound. I would also point out you can do stuff like this with the synthesizers. Like I have um, dope for A110.4 VCOs over there. Those are sine wave VCOs. They can do this too. You tell one of them to modulate the other one, and you start getting all these sounds. Easy as pie. So, that works. Now let's do something else. Let's start making four of these. Firstly, I'm going to copy this out. This is common. This is being modified. Actually, hang on. There's a better way of doing this. Check this out. Edit all in scope. There. This stays, because this is just the counter now. Now we have four of them. Now let's tell the four of them to be different instances. A, B, 
E, C, D, and no, not F, D. B, C, D. B, C, D. Same deal with all these. Because note there's a difference here. They have different delay sizes. B, C, D. And make sure to assign the correct thing to each of those. C, D. This should act like a magic trip of, trick if I do this properly, like if this is a really good session. Then it, a, C. What'll happen is I'll set it up to do the uh, matrix reverb. You're like, oh my God, how did that happen? So let's see these so far so good. Remembering that they are in fact all delay lines. Uh, we want the working variables also to be like this. It's also possible to define arrays of these and then kind of count through them. I'm not doing that right now because it keeps things a little bit more visible, I feel. And this is going to need a bit of updating. But I'll worry about that in a minute. Actually, no, I'll worry about that right now. Hang on. I can make the output value. I don't have to make it here. I'm just doing it for keeping it distinct. It could be defined down here or it could be defined directly in here. In fact, actually, that's a better idea. Let's do that. Then I can take these away. And now what we're going to do is, this is getting closer and closer to the matrix reverb thing. Yeah, OK2, I'm probably going to be refactoring it. But uh, now we update these things. All this A stuff is uh, relevant, but these all go to B. That could be somewhat, uh, hmm. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, I think that's still relevant. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, offset is actually something different from what we want. Uh, offset would have to be distinct for each one of these, too. Well, easily solved. Um, Or maybe it doesn't even matter. See, offset is a given number. Working A is always going to be rel relative to these sign, these integer numbers. So the, technically, this will still work. I'm fine. I've got offset minus four offset, and that's interpolating. But it's going to be able to calculate off of basically just what offset is because that's shared among all of them. So if offset is like 0.1, meaning that all of the little delay taps are 0.1 over, it'll do the same interpolation each time. That's not necessarily something I'm going to want to keep, but it's not going to break anything now. So we're going to charge ahead. B, working B, delay B. You could. Assuming you had only the capital letter for all of those things. In fact, come to think of it, check this out. This is a neat thing in this version of um,
hold down Option and in Selection. But, so, thank you, David, although I just did that wrong, so let's undo it. I want to change those to capital C. But yeah, in this version of Xcode and probably other versions of Xcode, you can do a Find and Replace. You can define it like this, and then if you hold down Option, it lets you do stuff in selection, and that's what I'd be wanting. So, whoop. Out C here, and then select this, and capital D, hold down Option, in selection, and boop. Thanks, David. Good point. I don't even need to do a text editor because I can find and replace within a selection, and that's what I really needed. That saved me a bit of time. Cool beans. Well done. Well done, soldier. Now we have four separate outputs. So for now, That is combining all of them. And it's an interesting thing having to do with the matrix math here that we'll get to later. But for now, input sample equals all these outputs. Now let's hear what we got. Eighteen warnings, I know what they are already. So I'm not worried. Come on, you. There we go. Here's the sign. This is the low frequency sign. So let's actually go back to the high frequency sign. And we have four different delays, all with the same behaviors. So. And I hear a hiccuping, and I better know why that's happening. I think either I've overlooked something. Up, oh. I have overlooked something. See here, I didn't do all the updates of all these, so some of them are just blank or not working. So I'm only assigning to one. That's not so. C, D. That should be incremented as well. And having done that, I think all the rest of these are done. So let's just quickly build this again and see whether this got us anywhere. That was an oversight. I forgot to do that bit. Dum -dum -dum. I sign. Now what do we got? I'll go back to the drums too so you can hear that. I sign. We got a high note. And they appear to all be oscillating at the same speed. That's interesting, but not entirely as intended. Actually, let's take a moment and fire up the drum rig, see if we can at least hear the different echoes. Because the signs were all matching. Dry. And a set of tightly related delays as one echo. Then, we can start 
only of A is getting incremented. So that's kind of cool, but... We are getting exactly one tap off of each of these delays in parallel. Here's where something else happens. Can we save this in somewhere? We could save it in AVG, couldn't we? So instead of doing this with it, we're going to keep it, not have to define these, We're using the thing that we were using for the vibrato. That would now have to be something different, but that's actually easy to settle. So we can use AVGZ for that. It doesn't really matter, just as long as it's anything we're not using. And we can cut back the offset a little bit. Uh, we're not. And figuring out how this is. Uh, so 0 0.1, that can be smaller. Range can be smaller. We're doing AG, AVGZ each time, so that's fine. And that only happens here. In fact, we can move this up to where this is so that it's a nice, tidy little area. We've now got this. Now this should do the same thing. I'm just testing in case it doesn't do the same thing. It's 12.52. I have promised you a reverb or something much like one within a limited period of time. We're going to see how close we can get to that goal. Again, if this works, Yeah, you can hear raw, four little delay taps. And now you can hear the differences in the delay taps. See, you hear the echo? And we can still This is me trying to listen for the vibrato. There it is. Nice little waver in there. A little subtle compared to listening to this thing. Now check this out. Matrix reverb. I have got input sample equals the outputs of these delay taps and they are raw outputs. If I use some of these other things, like say, seeing as I have these variables sitting around and they're starting out as nothing, 
AVG E. F they started remember as a averaging function EFGH just happened to be different uh, numbers if I run this right now nothing will happen because we've defined these as zero or they're not being changed but if we define one of them as DE, what we are doing now is feeding back the output of all of these into the input of one of them. It's being assigned the output of all the delays and then actually you know what we can copy this out and not have to worry about retyping it so there is our output and there is something else and not only that That is 100% feedback, so it should do something terrible. Let's find out. Let's see whether it's awful. Because this is not a correct matrix reverb, but we're very close to having one. If we do this, terribleness, but continuous feedback. So can you hear how this is going in a reverb direction? I'm honestly not quite sure why it's fading out, but that doesn't worry me because the trick is you're doing something else. AVGE AVG goes back into A. See, input sample plus complete feedback. So, this is what a matrix reverb is. Hang on. The ones on the diagonal here, 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 and here are positive. These other ones are negative. So AVGA minus B, C, and D, or B, hang on. Behave yourself, will you please? B gets fed back B minus A and C and D. C gets fed back C. Fumbling a little bit through all of this, but no matter. Minus A and B and D. So A is in phase and the others are out of phase. B is in phase and the others are out of phase. C in phase, the others are out of phase, and D. And this is apparently technically what's called a householder reverb. And we're going to see what that sounds like right now. 
at exactly one o'clock in the afternoon. And then input sample is all of those in parallel. Pretty much this, actually, you know, none of those are quite the same again, but uh, so we're taking the output and having it be like that. So did I remember to build this? Let's build this. Components and drum rig. Now, each of these delay buffers were a slightly different time. And that's another way that you can fool with it. Um, coming up with the right delay buffers is relevant. We'll take the vibrato off. Householder reverb. Now I would point out one thing. These reverb delay times are probably greater than we need. So what we're gonna do is go and fool with that while we're at it. And I believe I can use delay A. Yep, delay A, B, C, and D are the numbers we're gonna to wanna to refer to. So let's quickly take those and replace them with Z, Y, X, and W, or indeed even smaller. We might try smaller prime numbers. They do need to be prime numbers, but let's see what we got there. And if that doesn't enough, I'm going to go and find a list of prime numbers and just punch in some of those. This should be capable of using much smaller delay buffers. Those are enormous delay buffers for this kind of thing. And I feel like I might have miscalculated, like I might be able to get more gain in here. I'm tempted to try that too. And while I'm at it, let's make the output louder like quite a lot louder. Seeing as we're in the process of doing this, dum -dum -dum. Oops. here's the drum rig again. These delay buffers are quicker. This, however, does not sound like feedback to me. So let's do a quick little change. Let's divide all of these by two instead of four. See if we can get it hanging in there and sustaining. Ideally, I wanna get it to like run away with itself and go crazy as a final statement, but that's clearly not enough sustain. So we're gonna get busy. And if that doesn't work, I'll not scale it down at all, and we'll have 100% feedback. So let's see. Here's our minus, or divided by two, rather than divided by uh, four. I thought that was gonna be necessary, but it seems like I was wrong. There we go. That was the correct amount. So, let's skip this forwards. Edit this for a moment. Remind me not to save that. Here we have 
matrix verb, a householder matrix reverb. Oh, wait, I have to start it at the beginning first or I'll get nothing. Selection, move to start. Thank you, there we go. Matrix verb, voila. Yeah, it didn't do nothing. Let's move to start, and now let's hear it. It's misbehaving. Now it should give me something, please. I know you can uh, gain it. Is it one matrix reverb? This is a householder reverb algorithm. And it kind of continues forever at that setting. And we'll close this, not save that. And it might be interesting to fool with the offset here too. I think, however, you're getting the idea of uh, what that is. Let us just check this out. I should probably be able to control it by dialing down the feedback on just one of the output reverbs because it will propagate to all the others. If I'm wrong, this won't work. But if I'm right, this could be a bit of fun. Now we only have 15 warnings because I'm using one more of the things. Boop. And uh, recent effects. Sure enough. Full reverb. And now we are pitch varying. And for our last trick, as long as we've got that more or less working, and I am going to scoot out of here before very long. Let's find, I can find on this computer, I think, more easily. Prime number is less than 100. So let's use 97, 89, This could still be a bit sketchy, but we're now using the householder matrix arrangement, but with way, way smaller buffers. Will it still sound like a thing? quickly use this to dial all of these back a little bit. Oop, 
because we can make it be total feedback. So build that. Copy that over. A lot of this stuff is about tuning things nicely. Uh, this is using impossibly small delay buffers. So maybe not so much of the good. And I remember there was something that was being suggested. I'm going to quickly try that out. It is very ringy up there, but that's because the delay buffer constants are incredibly tiny. One thing that people sometimes use is prime powers. Their delay constants are a prime number multiplied by itself. And that apparently works out good. The ring is not an aliasing thing. The ring is the delay buffers being too quick. So 97. Seven, nine, four, oh, nine, eighty nine times eighty nine again to the second power or multiply by itself seven, nine, two, one, eighty three times eighty three, six, eight, eight, nine, and seventy nine times. 79.6241. This is going to bring it back into the more delayed uh, version of things. And they are more spaced out now. So what we get out of that is something a little like this. So you pick the right delay constants for this kind of thing. It's infinite. Turns out the multiply factor of two is what you want for infinite. And just for fun, I'm thinking about trying out a smaller power thing because that power thing did a pretty good job of taking it from really ringy to a more accessible kind of sound. And the really short sounds, the really short uh, prime numbers were very ringy. So rather than use like uh, 97 times 97, let's do 17, 19, 23, and 29. 17 times 17 is 289. I feel like that's kind of quick, though. Nah, let's see what it is. So 289, again, this is prime powers. Three sixty one. 23 times 23. 529 and 29 
is that's 841. Now we shall see what kind of space that produces for us. And again, this is without any damping unless we engage the pitch bend because we do have a pitch bend on all of these delay taps. So we can get an interesting effect out of that if we want. And that's not even an ideal pitch bend, but that's very clangy. But Hey, we have a gone. I see something we need to do. Let's make each of those vibratos independent. We're, we're playing all day here. I'm going extra long, but what the heck. I'll probably, I'll probably skip um, playing music today because this is taking up all my time and attention now. But there's no reason not to just run for it. So let's see what we can make happen here. We made an interesting gong. So let's see, offset, so rather than have the same thing update, hmm, I'm trying to think of what I can get out of here. Uh, so we can do these things. We can use these numbers somehow. It's going to get a little complicated, but that's fine. Um, delay W to Z, I think. Paste that in there and update the letter Y, X, Z. Now I don't know whether that is going to be the relevant accu, whether it's going to be even on the same relevant amount of number, but they're now going to all update separately. But I do have to do dedicated ones for each of these. And there's kind of a lot of places to put it in because this working A and offset A are being used in multiple places. So that's also got to go here because now this doesn't exist. 
So offset B, offset A. I'm generally fairly quick with this cursor stuff and like I'm very familiar with updating things in a pattern on the screen by just doing a series of key commands very rapidly. There, that should be it. Same 15 warnings, it's just all stuff we haven't used. And drum rig again. Matrix verb. There we go. This is a gong. With the interpolation, it's losing the highs more. And it actually starts to sound like a realistic small room. Made out of steel. That's amusing. I think we have had a successful day doing this insane matrix reverb. Now there's other experiments I was going to do as well, but I gotta get my head down and like rest a bit. Oh, one final, I can't quit just yet. I thought of a thing. Now, one thing I'm gonna to need to do is change some of these, however. However, I've got AVGU sitting around available for use. It is initialized, it is zero, and it is persistent. So,
Now that continues, and so therefore what we do is Let's use this technique in here. Actually, I got a better idea. So what that says is AVGU every time is now equal to either one or whatever the absolute of input sample is that is greater than one. However, we want it to be less than one. So, minus Okay, so now HVU equals if absolute input sample is not larger than one, it's going to be just one. It's going to be complete sustain. Times equals is multiplied by. So input sample times equals gain means input sample. Actually, come to think of that. This needs to go after this. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. That way I can pad it, you see. Question mark, I mean, exclamation mark equals means not equal. If wet is not equal to one, then do this. If wet equals one, you skip entirely through and don't do anything. So now AVGU equals, if input sample is large, absolute input sample is larger than zero, like we're clipping, then AVGU equals one minus whatever that is minus one. So anything that goes over one, our AVGU might, it sort of reflects back off again and AVGU might ends up being smaller by that amount. We could also scale it, but this is one very effective way of clamping it. And we build it and it's expecting something from me. So what do we got here? Oh, we didn't. I need to add the semicolon at the end of this. We build that. We're fine again as far as how many warnings we got because it's all warnings and no errors. And now we have our gong sound, but Is that not working? Okay, this is not working as anticipated, so I need to have a look at this and figure out what's going on. Am I, in fact, using AVGU here? Yes, I am. So the input is equal to the sample coming in, yes, but VG times AVGU, that should be less than one for Oh, 
Oh, I've got this backwards. Hang on. I'm not doing input sample minus one. I'm doing one minus the absolute of the input sample. That means that as it gets higher and higher, or do I in fact still have that correct? Um, the output needs to get smaller. Yeah, I am getting tired because it's two and a half hours now. And this is all cool and stuff. But uh, this is this is what it's like though, guys. I mean, developing these things, I do a plugin every week. It's usually like this. So this, this is this is what it is. So here we go. Um, If input sample is larger than one, we get the first option. That is one, but minus a amount that should be positive. And it's our, we know it's larger than one because we got there. So one minus whatever that is that is larger than one gets to be a smaller number again. Hmm. Okay, I think I'm having this backwards again. Let's try removing that bit. Some of these extra parentheses. There we go. This is looking a little bit better. You know, probably something like pocket verbs because there's just way too many, way too much code in it. Like this is relatively small. With this one, if I want to experiment with things like uh, a five delay buffer householder thing or something like that which people haven't really done i can just sort of include more bits but the whole thing practically fits in a screen so like pocket verbs is much huger so here's what we've got abgu starts out as one that's infinite sustain and it gets smaller so if input sample is larger than one meaning we're clipping either positively or negatively because it's an absolute value. Output is one minus Well, no, that's not right either. Absolute input value is going to be you know, let's the sequence of minuses and stuff. Yeah, I started this from scratch 2.5 hours ago and I spent the first two hours, or maybe an hour and 45 minutes, basically just getting you vibrato on a single reverb tap. So all of this is in the last less than an hour. Do it again. No! Uh, let's see. This should make it clamp once it starts clipping. We are turning down the feedback as soon as it starts getting too intense. And last time it didn't do it because it didn't have things in the correct sequence, but this time it should, unless I'm mistaken. I appear to be mistaken. Okay, let's try that again from scratch. Matrix verb. This time we have none of this stuff going on. We're at full gain, no clamping it. And we're gonna see whether it shuts itself up once it starts feeding back to the point of distortion. Uh, no, that's immediate death, wow, okay. Okay, this is cool and stuff, but it's not what I expected. So, something about this is wrong. Uh, AV, imagine what this is like when I'm doing this over headphones. Sometimes it's really painful. Uh, AVGVU is updated each time. AGVU is going to be one unless it is something less. So, this is our feedback. This is the number that is one or less than one. 
in order to control the feedback effect, these are all temporary values that hold stuff. Um, Let me see if I can do this in simpler terms. We're going to really clamp the hell down on it. So we ignore this because it was getting too fancy. And now if our input sample clips, and we can even put it in so that we can monitor what's going on a little better. We're doing that before gain so that we can pad it in case something else happens. Um, now if this is over 1, then we're automatically cutting stuff down a lot. That should stop it from feeding back to the point of being out of control. It should stop it really aggressively, in fact, and possibly with a bunch of ugly noise. Yay, ugly noise. Yeah, what was happening is, for, for whatever reason, that was literally not doing what I was intending it to do. Hey, infinities. Oh. Funky. So this is interesting. It freaked out. And our clip point looks to be around divided by four. Yeah. Yeah, this is as hot as it's willing to get. It's divided by four. And that gives us something useful. That means that, um, first of all, it's blowing up real aggressively. But if abs input sample, which is all of these things added together, is larger than That should maybe suppress it so that it stays within clipping, maybe. Bueller. Let's find out. Oh, of course I need to nap and look stuff over afterwards, but this is the job. This is what I do for a living. So you're sharing it this time. You're sharing all the aspects of it. Weirdly, we're getting the same result. At the full crank level, setting the gain output to 0 0.25 gives me a lack of clipping on the total output. No matter how freaky it gets. And it sounds kind of like this. So I didn't expect that, but that's interesting. Let's throw it at something else. Let's throw it at... Uh, 
So my old tracks from here. Same settings. It's a very bright reverb there. Alrighty. You could always put it in the middle of Eula. I should make one of those so that you could put it in the middle of Eula. I'll tell you another thing, however. The reason that it's doing this is because the output of all of these things is about four times the maximum output of input sample. So it always has to be divided by four to make that work. So one thing we could do in the end is divide it by four like that. Then, and you know I like the divides by two and divides by four because you don't touch the mantissa of the floating point number that way, is um, let's see, do we need to cut this back as aggressively as that? If abs is larger than 1.0, as u equals Here's where we get into that. Uh, here's where we get into that trying to reconstruct the previous algorithm. Minus So if it's larger than 1.0 Oh, we've just called it 1.0 so we can just Average u minus equals, so we subtract what this is, and this is the amount of it that is over 1.0. That really should work. That should actually work. Let's gonna, we're going to find out whether it works. We'll see what happens. And then we're padding it with the gain afterwards so we can have a sort of fallback position even if it doesn't do that very well. My hope is that I can scale it back in a way that is not so aggressive. But yeah, I guess we're going to find out, won't we? I'll go back to that other song that we were hearing before. And Oh my god. Wow. So there's a thing.
Where's our volume levels at? No, we're distorting there, so... If we go to 0 0.25, we never quite clip. I'm not sure if you can see the, the peak level there. And it just blew up. Something happened. I bet I know what. Huh? I bet I know what's happening. Another sanity check. You see what I just did there? What happens if a out of control waveform makes the absolute input sample be an enormous high number. What happens when the input sample effect is huge, it's like 12 or 2 million or something like that. If it's you, it becomes 1 minus 2 million, so it becomes negative 2 million, so the amount of feedback that we get becomes inverted, multiplied by 2 million. This is what was causing that. Let's go and prove it. We are now sanity checking it so that if it's less than zero, it has to be zero. That should do eat. And if this works, I'm going to go and have a rest. We'll call it a day. Let's go back to drum rig. Yeah, well, if before, if it was below, it became some increasingly huge number, like even larger than one, multiplied as a reverb. Well, I got upset with something right there. This is meant to be an infinite reverb, but it's still too loud. This is showing up at like 670B over. So let's see. Uh, that didn't do what I thought it was going to do. Um, We're scaling it back with this. These are still too huge. We're getting a lot of feedback in here. Feedback is pretty much infinite. AVGU is persistent and it's not being updated by anything. As far as I know, maybe it is. No, U, V, W, I don't have it anywhere else. Here's another possibility. When individual channels of this delay unit go excessive, as long as another individual channel is not as great, that can be... Okay, so W... T... Eventually, I'll be changing these to like normal things. Um, haven't touched any of these, so these will also function in the same way. And uh, and I don't know whether this will make it blow up and die, but we'll find out. That's always fun, as long as I don't have headphones on for it.
And we're going to be looking not at that, but at these. That be in our output. So now each of these get its own individual governor. And we can do that before Might not have wanted to do that, but we can at least see what this does. And then we're scaling that back by the same amount and over we go again. So rather than just uh, looking at the final output, which never seemed to work, we're looking at the output of each individual delay buffer and each individual delay buffer will damp itself down if its value goes too high. Now, granted, it might damp itself down into negative infinity and explode, but that's part of the fun, I guess. So let's, we're going to see what this does. Drum rig, and yep, we're doing three hours today. We're doing a long marathon thing. There's no way I'm playing today. I'm not getting the synthesizers going. We're getting a crackly noise. And that starts to sound like literally the correct feedback amount. I'm hearing an echo though, I'm hearing some kind of clipping. clipping. Interesting. So... One remaining thing we can do is dial that back a lot because we're probably doing it too aggressively. And it might also be worth sanity checking that because that was a concern. It was bad mojo to have it go negative, so... There are math operations you can do to do this as well. T U and V. Hello. No, still good. I got confused between what I was comparing. And this is why you change the names of things sometimes. This is not well implemented, but it's a quick hack, as in three hours worth of quick hack. Now it can only go down to zero and completely cut out the audio. If it's a huge negative number, it doesn't multiply the gain by negative, negative infinity and blow up. So there's that. We don't need that because we have it. And just for laughs, we're going to put the console system back in 
and hear what it sounds like. This entire craziness in expanded fashion, although granted still only over a lavalier microphone. Benefit of that also means I have a clipping stage in there, so it can't blow up as much as it was. All right, see you, David. I think I'm about done for today. Matrix verve, full crank for now, and So making the pitch wander a little bit seems to help. I'm still hearing a couple of little clatterings, but not as much. So there's an infant reverb. And if I go to a bit of music of some kind, like this one, we should be able to get a pad-like effect out of it. This being a householder style matrix reverb implemented very strangely. and on a tiny, tiny room, too. You know what? I think that's about enough for now. So yeah, three hours later, this has been kind of fun. Although honestly, I could get much more sensible results from like picking better reverb constants and going with that and using all passes because you normally use all passes to smooth stuff out a little bit. I'm not doing any of that. This is just the delay bin section. And yet, and yet, the householder thing is kind of working, kind of, sort of. It's doing something, and that means I might be able to push it farther. So that should be interesting. And at some point when I have it behaving well enough, I'm going to be wanting to listen to it over good headphones rather than just over the laptop, because it's in a state of insanity at the moment. But that's fine. So for now... I will say, talk to you guys later. I'm going to close down this prime number thing. And uh, close down ATEM software control and go and find OBS. There we are. Oh, I closed down ATEM software control when I could have used it to focus. Oh, well. So... On that note, I will talk to you folks later. And this has been an amusing little outburst, although I got to say I might need to focus on it on my own at some point just to get more sense out of it. But it's been a fun little journey. 
So on that note, I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.